Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Dorina Sackman Eboa, aka Ms. Dorio, and I'm coming to you from the Florida Georgia line before the sun comes up to welcome you to day 19, question 19 of Believe Cafe. <sighs> Oh my gosh, am I excited for today. Day 17 and day 18 were really strong points in truly practicing our skills of emotional intelligence and really understanding how we can um, manage our emotions, understand when there's an emotional event, what we must do and the process to really get that cognitive wing in there, to really allow the conversation to not just be an emotional one and the importance of anger management and where it stems from. Such amazing dialogue on social media and some private messages as well to some of our Believe Cafe fans who have done amazing jobs at responding to the questions with hashtag Believe underscore Cafe. I thank you for your vulnerability, for your honesty, and to reach out because it was an amazing day on Twitter that someone answered the question for day 18 and someone else goes, me too. I'm exactly like that. That is what Believe Cafe is all about. That is the connection where you realize you're not alone in this journey of transformative emotional intelligence or why you react or do the things that you do. We are all human learning this together and I hope you continue to join us on this journey. So raise your mug and your beverage of choice so that we may toast to each other on this amazing journey and transform our personal and professional lives as we think constructively and behave wisely. I am also celebrating a little victory today. Um, it's the 19th day and I have yet to repeat my mugs. And that is because I'm a hoarder. I mean, I'm a collector of mugs. And actually, it's not that I collect them. They're gifted to me by my husband. He'll walk into a store and see a mug and it's his little love language and shares that with me. And I absolutely adore it so much. And I'm so happy to share this one. This was the day after our wedding. Uh, we were in Key West and we were making coffee the next morning as husband and wife. And mine says, bonjour, beautiful. And his says, hello, handsome. So it is a wonderful memory. And I hope your mug of choice is a beautiful memory to you as well. Please take a picture of your mug shot and send it out, whether it's Twitter, Twitter, Twitter or Facebook, or whatever social media it is. I'm so excited to hear your stories as well. So let's toast to each other for happiness and health. Enjoy. Ah, what a beverage. All right, I got my messy bun, so let's have some fun, and my double chin, so let's dive right in, shall we? Here we go. Very important, especially in the field of education and if teachers are listening. This is important, especially if you are a teacher who takes kids out of the classroom, a resource room teacher, someone who pushes in, a paraeducator, um, a teacher with a teaching certificate who works with children and perhaps might have, to have their set classroom the whole day, um, or a teacher of content area that is not tested on. So you might be that teacher who uh, is teaching a subject that is important to our children, like the arts, but yet because it doesn't have an EOC or there's no state test on it, it isn't um, that important to many people and it is not considered um, of the utmost importance for your children, and which I obviously do not concur. I believe the arts are the reason why children would be emotionally intelligent, but that's just another conversation. My point being, why am I connecting that to this? Because deference is what happens when you take all of who we are, educators, we take who we are, the humble humility, all of who we are, right? The positives right here, humble, respectful, courteous, understanding, all of that is a positive of deference. We respect our elders. Uh, we respect the hierarchies. We respect our bosses or those who are of a different position than us. Although I do believe that education should be more lattice over ladder, to quote Catherine Bassett and Rebecca Milwaukee in The Adventures of Teacher Leadership, available now on Amazon. Phenomenal book, by the way. But the point is that Catherine would talk about a lattice of education, not a ladder, and that is extremely important. 
that the lattice is key, that we are all together. Think about mathematics or you think about a rose garden. We are lattice. We are all connected rather than trying to climb something. And with that, there would be less deference because we are seen as all equal. So with that, we, it is okay to be humble. It's okay to have humility. And it, do not mistake humility and helping out. That's okay. But when look at the negative, if you're too humble, too helpful, what happens is, is you become too differential, which can be crippling to you and your effectiveness. I want you to go back now and think about the times where you were over here in white, a pushover, taken advantage of, not seen as equal, ignored or overlooked, whether it be personal or professional, whether it be with family and friends or even spouses or partners or your children, or whether it be in with your colleagues and administrators and coaches and other t fellow teachers or students. What about now? The importance is to know being and having deference is a beautiful thing when used in moderation, when understanding that you are a courteous person, a humble person, you have humility, but it is not to the point where you are being taken advantage of. And that is what we're going to discuss because deference is actually a pattern of communication that becomes habitual and automatic, especially those who are on the shyer side and those who don't understand assertion yet. And the shyer side, because you're just, it's your personality, but people are misunderstanding your shyness. Therefore, it's deference and then it's being overtaken by people taking advantage of you because of your own personality. And that's the person who lacks emotional intelligence because they're not seeing it and being empathetic through your eyes. So I want you to realize that deference, again, is key to understanding that the pattern of communication has to be converted. So to have too much deference, if you're recognizing that and in your reflective thought about one's emotion, it is converted to the powerful part of transformative emotional intelligence managing anxiety. Deference falls under anxiety management. Isn't that strange? But the reason it isn't strange is because if you think about it, someone who has deference and then actually is too deferential and just constantly, oh, do you need me to work with the kids today? No, you're testing? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow. No, no, sure. You want me to come back tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll email you, okay. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, sure. yeah, sorry. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. That right there. Those type of, uh, of interactions with other teachers is what can actually put you in a position where they could be innocently ignorant to it or arrogantly ignorant to it and say, mm, Esau teacher, nah, nah, I'm good. I'm fine, thanks. And does not see you as equal, right? Art teacher, okay, go, go, go do your paint by numbers. I'm doing quadratic equations here, right? So as nice and wonderful as those teachers may be, they still, because of the way you do your pattern of communication with them to work with the children, they see you this way. And that is wrong for you as a teacher leader. And what happens is you get frustrated. You're not getting answers. People are not really listening to you. And that can cause anxiety and stress. Hence the reason it falls under the anxiety management and that your deference must be converted into assertion, not aggression. That's where I went from one end of the spectrum to the other. I went from, okay, I'll come back to, hey, listen, you better start doing this because these kids are your kids because roster equals responsibility, lady. Now you got to find that fine line in between, right? So sometimes that'll happen as you're learning, right? In transformative emotional intelligence and reflecting on your own personality and thoughts and patterns of communication with others. But assertion is key, not aggression, assertion, which we already talked about in another sesh, but we want you to understand a little bit more the breakdown of the different types of assertion. So what is assertion? Well, it's a way in which you communicate that really expresses your thoughts and you stand up for yourself in a manner that, again, assertion with grace and that you actually increase your self-esteem 
And it's a way to maintain your sensitivity as a person, your humility as a person, but still you're true to your own thoughts and feelings about a specific subject or situation or emotional event. Now, this can be broken down into three different things, and it falls under self-management and self-improvement under the hallmarks or pillars of transformative emotional intelligence. So the first one that we're going to discuss is basic. Think of basic as one. One thing that you do, you stand up for yourself. That's it. With assertion, with grace, not aggression. So let's just use a personal example. Okay, your personal example for basic assertion would be um, your husband wants to cook steaks on the grill and you actually don't want to do red meat for a while. You kind of want to do for a couple of weeks, do a little bit more of the vegetarian or pescatarian and you don't want meat. And your husband is adamant about having that red meat, the blood flowing, doing the whole thing. And you just kind of are like, hmm. Maybe I'll just have it and just be quiet because you just want to keep the peace. What does that do to you? Your basic assertion is, honey, I, you can have your, your steak. I'm sure it's going to be delicious, but you only have to make one. So if it's in the freezer, just thaw out one. I think I'm going to double up on the vegetables today. Uh, whoa, what is, what's going on? You're turning vegan on me. I don't know who, what husband talks like this, but whatever. And no, honey, I'm not. I'm just letting you know this is what I would like. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, some people say, well, that's what could turn into an argument. Well, there, that's a different issue. <laughs> you need to understand that what you're doing is assertion and you're standing up for yourself. Perhaps they're painting uh, a room a certain color and you don't particularly care for that color. You have to just simply say, you know what? I believe, of course, with I, not you. Why are you painting it that color? Why are you doing this? Obviously, the I statements that everybody learns about are very important. And just say, you know, I, I think it's a great color, but in the sun, it looks a little bit darker. So do you think maybe we could test it first in one wall and see what happens? Because I believe that I, I think a lighter color would be better in this room. This is what I prefer. There's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of times, again, like we talked in the other session, it would be called an itch with a B. And that is not it. Assertion is not that. Assertion is, oh, I know where you stand and I, I see that now because you're standing up for what you believe, your thoughts, your beliefs, your values, your inner culture. Now, there's, that's the basic one. There's one thing, you just say it, it's kind of a light thing. You just want to stand up for yourself. You move on without assertion, uh, excuse me, without aggression, assertion. The second one is empathetic assertion. Empathetic assertion has two sentences attached to it. And what that means is, and I hope you can see this and you can always pause it and read it, but an empathetic assertion, it says you convey recognition for others. You're conveying the recognition for others and what they're thinking or their beliefs, right? You recognize that and then you express your own. So perhaps in empathetic, you turn around and you say to somebody in a situation, um, I really appreciate what you're going through right now. And I, I really want you to understand that I'm listening to everything that you have to say. There's a lot going on in education and you've got 30 kids in the classroom and it's very difficult to manage. And now you have three, four newcomers and you are trying to do the best to service them. And I see that and I observe it and I recognize it. Um, but uh, putting them on Imagine Learning while you're teaching the other students actually might be harder work for you. So express my own thoughts. In my observations and in my expertise, I do see that getting the same information and sitting in the classroom perhaps next to another ambassador student and then me looking at your lesson plans and scaffolding them to teach you how to do that, I'd love to work with you on that. Those are my thoughts on the matter. What do you think about that? I mean, come on. Whether that's in an email or whether that's in front of somebody, that person will take you seriously. Because think about the person before. Yeah, I, I'm going to come in and I'm observe and I'm not going to do anything because, you know, it doesn't count and I know teachers don't like to be observed. I'm just coming in just to take a look at the kids and see how they're... That person isn't taking you seriously. No way. 
You have a certificate exactly as theirs. You're teaching longer than theirs. You've got a master's and they don't. Yeah, I'm going to come in and then, but I'm not going to observe you. I'm going to see with the kids and then I'm going to give you feedback. Is that okay? Mm -mm 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 -mm. So that's where the empathetic is. You know that teacher's going through a lot and they don't want you in that room. But you know what? You're expressing that. You're conveying the recognition for what they're going through. But then you're also expressing your own thoughts and observations as an expert. And that needs to be done more. And that is a practice, step-by-step -step practice, that you have to do a pattern of communication with everybody and the consistency. But that will take time. And I've been practicing that and practicing that, and I've gotten so good at it that people know when I walk into a room, they know, all right, she, I know where she stands and I know what she's meant. I know why she's here. And I can talk to her straightforward. She shoots from the hip. I know how she thinks, but man, oh man, is she fun. And I respect her and I've, I, and I've earned the respect of people because of assertion, not aggression and not deference, right? The, the overuse of deference, if you will. The third assertion is called confrontational assertion, which comes up with three sentences. Now, these three sentences are very important because you might be coming up with this a lot when it comes to working in your profession and advocating for equity and advocating for English language learners. So let's say, for example, and again, this is for everybody, but I'm using the example of English language learner teachers, coaches, co-teaching, etc. So the confrontational assertion is three. And the first statement is recall what the person says they would where they were going to do. So let's just say that in um, the teaching profession, you recall that the person said that they were not going to put the students on Imagine Learning in the back while they were giving the uh, initial lesson. When you went back into the classroom, you saw that they're still on Imagine Learning. So you simply recall what they said they would do. And you say, I remember the last time we said that we were gonna um, take the children from Imagine Learning and they were going to be set up with ambassador kids and they were gonna be involved in the content and they were going to listen to the lesson equitably like everybody else. So I do recall that's what our last feedback or conversation was. Number two, you objectively describe what they did. So I'm, objectively I'm describing exactly what happened is that for the past couple of days, I have been observing the students w w working on Imagine Learning while you're doing the lesson. So I just wanted to uh, show you my observations since the last time. Three, express what you would like to see happen, okay? So perhaps um, just bringing this to your attention and showing you the research and the importance of having students sit next to other students and listen to what you're doing, having some academic word walls of the content vocabulary there and me scaffolding your lessons to help you with that, uh, I think that's what I would like to see. I believe, not think, that that's what I would like to see the next week I come and observe the class. What do you think about that? Now, we have to work a little bit on, what do you think about that? You know, I'll have to work on that because I still got that New York shoot from the hip. And so I've got to be that without sounding condescending or rude. So I have to work on my assertion. But that's an example of using this in a pattern that every time you go into a room and you do that, that then they will see, okay, I get it, I respect it, I understand. And whatever pushback you might get, you can put your hand, head in your pillow at night and say, I practice confrontational assertion with the challenging content area teacher, and this was the reply. Document, move on, head on pillow, anxiety management is maintained, and you feel good. So these are the things that can truly help you as a leader, as someone who takes data and information and then re, uh, re, reiterates that information or gives the information to the teachers in a manner that is very constructive, right? And not emotional because nothing they do should be personal towards you. Nothing, nothing. And this is a really interesting thing that many times people who take things so personally are the broken people. And I know that's hard to say, but if you take things personally that someone does or says, 
you have to step back and use your cognitive mind and say, this has nothing to do with me. This teacher is so stressed out and she doesn't need me in here. She's got other stresses, but I have to be in here for equitable education. This is my job and my job is to help her whether she receives it or not, whether he receives it or not, whether they want to receive it or not, I'm still going to do my job and I'm going to do it damn well. So this is the assertion that we're talking about. Basic, one sentence, stand up for yourself. Empathetic, two statements. You convey the recognition of the other person using empathy and compassion. And then you express your thoughts and observations on the situation. And then confrontational, you recall what they say, right? And what they said they would do. Then the second, you objectively describe what they did. In then the third one is express what you would like to see happen or what you would want for the next time. What leadership, what a great way to be a teacher. What a great way now, not only teaching teachers, now put this towards the students. Talk about norms. What a wonderful lesson to teach students. Talk about SEL, put TEI. Let the students know what assertion is so that you know what they where they stand when they have conversations. What a beautiful thing to teach. Eight, eight through 12, I believe, would be the strongest for this. And it's a wonderful way for all of us to see that we still can have humility, still be respectful, still respect our elders, still respect those in a position of authority. Yet we still, still can speak our minds, fight for our rights through the power of emotional intelligence by expressing ourselves emotionally as we think constructively and behave wisely. When we express ourselves emotionally, yes, but we're doing it with the balance of the cognitive mind and we're doing it with emotional intelligence because we're reflective on our thought and we have self-directed behavior. So your goal for today, and this one might take a little bit, is to really think about, take a look down here on Q19. Can you recall a situation where your deference impacted a decision or impacted the situation, right? Is there a time where your deference Cause something to not happen, something to happen the opposite, just something where you're like, man, if I only was stronger in that situation. And I'd use the word stronger, but now I want you to say, man, if I was only just a, more assertive in that situation. That's what I want you to think about, even if it just happened yesterday or this morning, right? Okay. And then you could say with assertion and with this information, what would you do, do differently in that scenario now? Not what would you have done, past is the past, but if that scenario was to come up now, what would you do? And you have your sentence frames answering A19 hashtag believe underscore cafe. I recall a time when, and with assertion, I. These are just guidelines for you. I recall a time when, and with assertion, I. So I recall a time when, and I gave my examples, and then with assertion, I can do this. So I recall a time when I allowed teachers to use the excuse of a hurricane and the situation of what happened in Hurricane Michael to be the reason why they don't have enough time to help English language learners. It is not their job. What their job right now is to try to educate. And my job was to work with them to help the English language learners. And I look back and I think I could have done confrontational and I could have simply just said, um, well, we did say what we were going to do with our English language learners and we we're going to do professional development based on their linguistic and academic needs together. Um, objectively, I'm describing that that was not done for the past semester. And um, I would like to express to you that my thoughts on this and my expertise is that I have created videos and screencastifies for you to show you how to do this. And I would love to see a change in the classroom when I come back to observe in the next two weeks, because I know you're really busy and you have a lot on your plate. Now I just use empathetic number two at the same time. This is exactly what I'd like you to do. Recall a time when, and then now with assertion, I would do this. 
And I, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited to hear your answers. I'm excited to see if this empowers you. It is a shift, a big shift in your pattern of communication, but it's going to be a great one. So do answer and take your time, whether you want to answer it on YouTube or you want to answer it on um Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, do do it because other people will be so influenced by your passion and by your desire to change your pattern of communication. All right. This is so much fun. So I really want to toast to you because it was a great, great sesh. And I'm so excited that I'm going to read a lot of your responses and hopefully that you will grow. And if you choose not to respond, that's okay too. This is about you and how you are taking this journey on emotional intelligence. So again, I hope that you understand the balance of the cognitive mind and the emotional mind, and that you understand to think constructively and behave wisely, and that you believe. Be the educators who lead to inspire and empower via excellence. Such happiness to you all, and I toast to you. Ah, what a beverage. Have a fantastic